Eric Solheim, welcome to World Affairs. Thank you so much. Uh, very happy to be here. Recently, you wrote, if we all come together and work together, there's no limit to what we can achieve on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. But right now, billions of gallons of fresh water are running into the northern Atlantic, and billions of gallons that used to run into the Gulf of California aren't coming in from the Colorado River because the Colorado River is just a trickle now mm -hmm. by the time it reaches the Gulf of California, mm -hmm. changing the ecology and threatening unique ecosystems in the American Southwest, while hotter and hotter American cities are pulling more than their share out of the river. The tensions between herders and farmers in Africa, always there, are now boiling over into something closer to civil war. There's chaos in the natural world, in the fisheries, in the air, among the insects. I like your optimism, <laughs> but I wonder what justifies it. <laughs> it, it. It's not at all difficult to find reasons for optimism. And we have, we have uh, sorted out a huge amount of problems in the past. Uh, as an example, I mean, the biggest environment issue when I was a uh, fairly young politician was the uh, threat to the ozone layer. It was a big problem, and we saw the ozone layer disappearing, and we uh, got any number of, of skin cancer cases, a uh, huge threat to, the, to agriculture all over the planet. Well, we came together in Montreal, Canada, we meaning Ronald Reagan, conservative American president, Margaret Thatcher, even more conservative British uh, UK prime minister. They came together, made a global agreement, and if we have delivered by 2050, the ozone layer is fully back in shape. All the money which was promised is delivered, uh, all the po political commitment is delivered, and the business have found uh, all the technology we needed to, to deliver. So it's just, of course, just one example that I don't share the pessimism of all, all your examples. All these are solvable problems, but we will be able to resolve them if we come together. If I allow someone to split us, we will have difficulties with basically every one of them. I was at COP15 in Copenhagen and saw countries that acknowledged that a lot of these things were mm -hmm. happening, mm -hmm. but were also as worried about sovereignty, <coughs> about fairness, mm -hmm. about what constitutes a proper level of investment, political will, sacrifice from stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So you'd be interviewing an environment minister from the global north mm -hmm. and talk about the compact on <coughs> rainforests. Mm -hmm. And he, that person would acknowledge, yes, we have to save them. They're the lungs of the planet. Mm -hmm. And then you'd say, well, is your country ready to sign on to the compact? Oh, no, no, mm -hmm. no, no. Mm -hmm. There's a disconnect between the knowledge and understanding of the systems that are rolling out in the world and the kind of action that would be required to at least start pushing in the other direction, isn't there? Well, I think uh, the co co uh, comparison between Copenhagen in 2009 and today uh, shows how much we have progressed. Because in, in Copenhagen in 2009, I was there, I was Norwegian Minister of Environment at the time, and spent an enormous amount of time to try to make Copenhagen a success, which it was not. Why was it a failure? Well, basically because we in Europe and North America thought we had the solutions and didn't really reach out to the rest of the world uh, in, a, in a partnership. And the Chinese and the Indians and others were, surprise, surprise, not happy with that, so they didn't want to play ball. Now it's completely reversed. I mean, the Chinese and the Indians are in the lead on climate. They are, they are moving ahead at the speed no one thought possible. Prime Minister Modi of India has completely transformed the Indian debate into debate in the past it was, do we want to develop or do we want to take care of Mother Earth? And then of course nearly all Indians wanted to develop and didn't take Mother Earth that seriously. Now it's how can we develop and take care of Mother Earth at the same time? How can we provide electricity to all Indians but do it by solar energy? How can we provide toilets to all Indians, but do it in an environment-friendly fashion so that we clean up the big rivers? It's a complete sea change, and the, at the core of it is that the Chinese are not into climate for us, <laughs> meaning the Europeans and the Americans, nor are the Indians, they're into it for themselves. And they are now in the lead, and we have to accept that on many, ma in many areas, China and India are now moving forward at the speed with which the West simply need to uh, replicate. When you talk to American politicians who have been skeptical about any global agreement, mm -hmm. the first thing they talk to you about is coal-fired plants in China. Mm -hmm. 
coal mining in China mm -hmm. about some of these equity issues that they see in a very different way. Mm -hmm. Even though the United States is history's number one emitter, mm -hmm. they want to freeze the game at tomorrow, mm -hmm. let's say, mm -hmm. and say, well, we're not anymore. Mm -hmm. So even though we have a big responsibility for everything that's happening now, I want to talk about the future. And they avoid the question. I'm wondering if politics is even a workable realm for some of these things to be hammered out. It seems like in much of the world, the, poli the normal operation of politics walks you right up to the line where things get really difficult and then it freezes there. I have a very, very uh, humble suggestion to these American politicians. And it, please open your eyes. Please look at all the amazing positives which are happening in China. By the way, I give exactly the same advice to the Chinese because in, it's very easy to find an audience in, in China, which is America bashing, telling that everything is wrong in, in the United States of America. Then I give them the uh, advice. Please open your eyes and look to all the amazing positives in the, in the United States of America, all the companies who are moving fast on climate, all the states like California who are moving fast on climate, and by the way, the amazing tradition of this brilliant nation, the United States of America, with people like uh, Abraham Lincoln or George Washington. Please open your eyes. But frankly, these American politicians also need to open their eyes. The Chinese have reduced the pollution in the big cities by 30 to 40 percent just in the last few years. They're closing down coal fire plants by the day. Uh, one ambassador in Beijing told me maybe between one and two million people have been fired in the coal industry in China. We were at one of the biggest uh, car renting companies in China, the, the Chinese Uber, Didi. They had specific program for how to hire people who had went out of the coal industry to make them drivers uh, for, uh, for Didi in a, the social responsible way that, yes, you were in the coal industry, but we need to provide something new for you. Maybe you can be a driver with us. So, uh, frankly, please open your eyes, these guys. Please look to all the positives from China, and then we give the same message to China. Please open your eyes and see all the positives in the United States of America. You are an optimist. That's terrific. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it, it is true that the world has created tremendous wealth in the last generation, sure. lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. But we're also changing the map of the world mm -hmm. and transforming where human beings can possibly live mm -hmm. in 2040 and 2050. And I don't know if the world has totally reckoned with that problem yet. There are places right now that are home to tens of millions of people that are going to be very difficult places to live not that long from now. A absolutely. I mean, when, when I'm optimist, is of course uh, optimism based on realism. We have had, had enormous success at the starting point. We have reduced globally extreme poverty by two-thirds since the 1990s. When you and me were born, I mean, we may be around the same age, maybe, life expectancy on planet Earth was 46. Now planet the life expectancy is 71, meaning that there was, uh, has been a lot more progress since you and I was born up to today than there was from Adam and Eve up to we were born. So it's amazing success, but on base of that success uh, in so many areas, of course, we can take it forward to, to, the, to the big issue of, uh, of the day. And true, I mean, there are areas on the planet which will be very, very hard to live. If you see sea level rise, I mean, lower areas of, say, Bangladesh will be uh, absolutely threatened with, with cyclones and storms and, uh, and, and heat waves. Some parts of the planet will be very, very difficult to leave, live in. But then, of course, uh, also the states are much stronger. Civil society in most places is much stronger. So there are also countermeasures. Give one example. I was in Japan last week. Japan was facing the biggest cyclone in modern times. It was the biggest storm, at least in the last 30 years. It was enormously big. Ten people died. Ten. Uh, the lower is so... When, when, I mean, when you saw the forces of nature, the, the, the number is so low. Why? Well, all buildings are very strong in Japan. The glue in Japanese society is very strong. 
Uh, they have any number of warning system informing people on what to do and what, uh, not what to do. The rescue system to move people away from the dif most dangerous places. So they have all the place, uh, systems in place to face such an extreme weather event. So it shows that the economic development and environment is intimately linked. If you have economic uh, development, it's also much easier to, to face environmental crisis. You mentioned Bangladesh. A lot of Americans don't know very much about Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. It's about the size of our state of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And unlike our state of Wisconsin, it's home to about 150 million people. Mm -hmm. And there's less Bangladesh than there was 10 years ago and 20 years ago because the land is literally being eaten away by the uh, tremendous river basin that drains through the country and the ocean that's coming in from the other direction. This is a very agriculturally dependent people. India do, will not want to take them. Pakistan mm -hmm. will not want to take mm -hmm. them. Uh, Iran will not want to take them. We're talking about 60 million climate refugees in the coming decades. Where are they going to go? Uh, but also in Bangladesh, there is huge reasons for optimism. Uh, I mean, th in, in the 1970s, there was a storm uh, in Bangladesh killing 500,000 people. Probably the biggest storm or biggest natural catastrophe anywhere in, in modern history, anywhere in the world. 500,000 people died. If a sing similar storm were to hit Bangladesh tomorrow, still of course it would be very, very severe, but the number of deaths will be for sure in the low thousands, maybe in the hundreds. Why is that? Well, society is so much better prepared. Every Bangladeshi has their own mobile phone, even the poorest ones. You get warnings and instructions on how, how to act. They have centers for where people can move. They build any number of houses on pillars so that the, so that the uh, storm can go under. They even built cattle houses on pillars for, for this purpose. Why is that? Well, if you are a poor man, you want to save your cattle in a, in a storm, otherwise you have nothing uh, after the storm. So there is any number of preparedness which make Bangladesh much better suited to handle this than in the past. But still, yes, it's a huge challenge which we need to face. Sea level rise will, be a, will make uh, homes of millions of people potentially uh, uh, inhabitable. Uh, and Yes, it's a, it's a big problem, but also society ma much, much better prepared. And also, I mean, remind yourself of this success story of Bangladesh. I mean, Henry Kissinger spoke about Bangladesh as the basket case. <laughs> it was not a favorable uh, notion. At the time, there was an enormous population growth in Bangladesh. Now it's stabled. The average Bangladeshi Muslim woman get 2.1 children. So there is no more pa population growth in Pakistan. In, uh, sorry, in Bangladesh. In Pakistan, however, uh, it's a huge population growth. I mean, at the time of independence of Bangladesh in 1971, the population of Bangladesh was higher than Pakistan. Now there's 50, more pe 50 million more people living in Pakistan than in Bangladesh. So showing the enormous success in many respects of social and economic developments in Bangladesh. So there is hope. You mentioned Japan, fastest aging society on earth. Mm -hmm a place where there will be declining population in the coming decades, mm -hmm. they have taken so far zero refugees. Mm -hmm. They take virtually zero immigrants. Uh, can we have a, a world in coming decades where um, people are unwilling to do their burden? Right now, the politics of Several European countries are being destabilized by the debate over immigration. Mm -hmm. People are climate refugees from the Eastern Mediterranean. Japan serenely sails away from that problem by uniformly taking the same number of refugees every year, zero. Japan, of course, historically was probably the most homogeneous society anywhere in the world fairly isolated from the rest of the world and an extremely homogeneous population. So for Japan to accept refugees or migration seems to be very hard. But they are paying a very high price. Uh, the population of Japan is now reduced by close to one million every year. There has been no economic growth in Japan since the 1990s, uh, early 1990s. I compare it to my nation Norway or to Canada or to the United States. We have of course had a huge economic growth in the same period. So there is a big price to be paid for Japan not to accept uh, migration and having such a low 
uh, fertility rate for, for, for women. Uh, but that's their choice, and for the Japanese people to accept migration seemed to be uh, hard. When um, Kenyan politicians say, we can't handle two degrees Celsius rise, uh, when Somali politicians say, more of our land is uninhabitable than ever before, uh, the world is a much tighter place. And along with Japan, there are many other places that don't take very many refugees. We're talking about hundreds of thousands in a world where tens of millions are displaced. This is only going to become tougher in the coming years, where the number of climate refugees rises and the reluctance about taking them also rises as well. We, we need to also realize that the number one answer to the refugee crisis is to make situation lively, uh, uh, possible to live where you come from. There is no way uh, the, the world will be, be able to accept any numbers of millions of refugees coming to your place. I mean, there simply is no appetite for that anywhere, anywhere in the world. So to really reduce the, uh, the problem, we need to be much better in conflict mediation much better in, in uh, combating climate change and of course much better in uplifting the livelihood of people in, in, in poor places. Uh, the Afri Africa today has a population of 1.2 billion people, a little bit less than China. By 2050, Africa will have a population by 2.5 billion, double the population of China at the time. Africa is now basically the only place in the world where you see a rapid, uh, rapid population growth. Uh, that mu must be matched with much bigger investment in, in, in Africa, poverty elevation, creating jobs. There is no other answer to this. There is no way 2.5 billion Africans will be uh, absorbed in Europe or, or in North America or any other place. They will have to be absorbed in Africa, but uh, Africa is growing. And they'll have one of the world's last great labor pools mm -hmm. as the rest of the world is yeah, aging. That's right. A tremendous number of Africans will be between um, 15 and 35 years old. And, and that's why the ch what the Japanese are afraid of. And of course, the, Chine the Chine Chinese population is also rapidly uh, moving towards aging. Uh, so this is a huge asset to Africa, for sure. Can we make, um, sort of repeat the trick? continue to make hundreds of millions of people richer, more stable, more comfortable, healthier, without a significant cost to the environment? Absolutely, and the answer to that is y yes indeed, because that's really the old debate, which was everywhere. Uh, do we want to develop and have economic prosperity, or do we want to uh, curb pollution and take care of the environment? Because it, it may have been uh, the right debate in the beginning, because the uh, Industrial Revolution coming first in the United Kingdom, then to the United States, then to the rest of Europe, then to Japan, and finally to Korea, China, other places. M at the time, it may have been so that first we needed to develop and then, then take care of the planet. It's nothing like that anymore. We have in nearly every area policies which will bring economic growth, create jobs, are good for the social benefit of people, for our health, and very good for climate and, uh, and Mother Earth at the same time. If we move from coal into solar energy, creating more jobs, more jobs for women, very m uh, creating much better health for us, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and of course very good for climate. If we move into taking care of, uh, of nature so that we get more tourists, again, win on all this. If we move into electrical mobility in the cities and better mass transit systems, again, more jobs, better for the economy, better for the health, better for the environment. So we need to get out of this very old-fashioned debate of whether um, we pr prioritize economy or, or environment. We can do uh, both and say just yes, thank you. Well, China, as you point out, is taking this seriously. Mm -hmm. It's a very big, dirty economy and the cleanest economy in the world at the same time. They're mm -hmm. doing amazing things, mm -hmm. innovative, exciting things, and still have a lot of dirty old industry. Mm -hmm. But they also don't have a democracy. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if, as you look around the world, uh, whether there are mechanisms uh, by which the Central Committee of the Communist Party also feels that it has to respond to the people's will. They may not have elections, but they know that their future legitimacy, to some degree, rests on 
not having people die because they're breathing the air in Beijing, mm -hmm. not having people uh, with chronic uh, lung disease because they're breathing the air in Tianjin. Mm -hmm. um, are there uh, ways in which perhaps it's not a democracy, but it is responsive to public need in that way? Yeah, that's in my view exactly what is happening in China at the moment. I mean, whenever I had a conversation with a person from the middle class of China, it was always the same. People would say, uh, I would say, oh, you must be very, very lucky. I mean, look at all these shopping centers, skyscrapers, this development. You are 100 times richer than your parents were in before uh, the reform started in China in 1978. Such a fantastic development. And then the person would nearly always reply, yes, <laughs> you are very grateful. We know how lucky we are, but I want to see the sun. Uh, or I don't want my children to live in this hell of pollution. And this message has come clear uh, and loud to the political leaders of China. And that's what they're responding to by now drastically reducing uh, pollution. My very good friend Li Ganzhou, who's the environment minister of China, is running around closing down coal fire plants uh, ev basically by the day. And you see the, uh, you see the effect. I mean, I was in China last week. The sun was shining, was bright. Sky was, uh, the sky was blue. It was simply fantastic. Uh, Th not every day in the winter in Beijing will be like that, but many, many more days uh, than, than in the past. So the policies work, and President Xi Jinping has launched one, my view, brilliant slogan, ecological civilization. Another one is green is gold, meaning that going green, going into an environment can provide jobs and economic prosperity. So sorry to say, <laughs> a lot of Americans, a lot of Europeans do not have open eyes for what hap what's happening in China. As unfortunately, a lot of Chinese do not have open eyes for what's happening in the United States of America. Can a, a, a wealthier and wealthier China eventually have uh, per person the same kind of carbon footprint that uh, the United States does, that France does, that uh, Britain or Norway does? Uh, I will turn it a little bit around. We all need to reduce. Uh, there is no way the entire world can have the carbon footprint of the big emitters of, of today. We all need to reduce. The United States need to reduce. Europe need to reduce. China uh, need, to, need to reduce. Africa and India will have to increase, but they cannot increase in the same speed as, as we did. There is no way Africa can develop with exactly the same uh, uh, footprint as today. However, a nation like Ethiopia has promised to be a m and 100 million people, so it's not insignificant, to be a middle-income country by 2025 and with no increased emissions. How will it happen? Well, there will be increased emission in, industri in industry and in transport, but they will reduce similarly uh, from tree planting and from agriculture. Well, Ethiopia is a place that's right on the front line of this. Absolutely. Uh, desertification, uh, loss of arable land, um, the land that is farmable being asked to carry more people per hectare than, than they did in the past. Um, is it that kind of thing that actually concentrates the need to do it? That Ethiopia can make a bold declaration like this before countries in the temperate zone have to. Absolutely. I think that's why we are in a better place than in the past, because no one is into fighting the climate uh, uh, disaster for someone else. People are fighting for themselves, which is normal in politics. Uh, but of course, climate change will have more disastrous effect for India than for the United States of America. And the Indians know that, and that's why they are, are into this. And same with African leaders. They are not into it for us, I mean, as Westerners, they are into it for themselves. And some African nations also have had amazing success. I mean, take uh, Rwanda as an example. I mean, coming out of the genocide, 800,000 people murdered in three months. I mean, it, uh, I mean uh, it was a speed of murder. Hitler even uh, didn't manage in, in, in killing Jews. I mean, it's so absolutely horrible. Out of that coming a nation which is now rapidly growing, cleanest in the world, uh, uh, and with e economic and environment success. I mean, they're also among the best in Africa in protecting wildlife. Gorilla, num number of gorillas in, in Rwanda is rapidly coming up because they do it in such a way that they can attract tourists, and from tourists they get income, which makes uh, even better protection of the, of the gorillas. So there are many African success stories, but indeed there are also African failures for sure.
Now, Rwanda also, interestingly, as a national goal, is becoming Africa's Internet hub, yeah. uh, which is a way of taking people off the land and reducing some of the pressure on, uh, on agriculture. A smaller percentage of Rwandans are making their living through agriculture than, than in the past, which is... There is no way African population growth can be ad uh, accommodated in the countryside. Uh, they will have to go into cities uh, uh, and then, of course, modernize the economy. However, of course, many African cities at this stage are overwhelmed by waste, very heavily polluted, and have big problems. But all these problems are solvable. Th that's my message. If we mobilize the political will and also the forces of private sector and investment, uh, we, can c we can overcome this and, uh, and African cities can be really, really, really beautiful and livable. I'm glad you brought up the private sector because s in some places in the world, being rich allows you to not learn from your mistakes. Mm -hmm. So right now, a tremendous hurricane is headed for the east coast of the United States. Mm -hmm. On very fragile land, millions of dollars worth of houses, roads, shops, other kinds of infrastructure will be destroyed by this hurricane and then rebuilt, and then destroyed again in another four or five years or 10 years. We can do that because we're rich. That is, that's not an option necessarily open to Cuba or the Dominican Republic, which is also facing more frequent and more powerful hurricanes in the coming years. Mm. Will the frequency and severity of storms force changes in what insurance companies are willing to cover, in what cities are willing to uh, rebuild after storms. Will finally uh, governments just say, well, if you rebuild there, we're not going to write you a policy. You can rebuild there if you want, mm -hmm. but it hasn't happened yet. It's on the verge of happening. A lot of insurance companies are, are moving in the dire direction you, you say because they know that they're, they're uh, assets or their but, uh, or their profits are depending on, on, on moving on climate. We have a, have a very positive, amazing in initiative right here in the United States where UN Environment is working with 86 mayors along the uh, Mississippi River, uh, with also with some foundations I in setting out. I mean, this is the number one food production area in the world. There is n nowhere else so much food is produced. A lot of vulnerable communities there. It's very vulnerable to climate change. Uh, we set out some figures also from rivers uh, when we started. But there is an enormous enthusiasm from these uh, mayors and bipartisan, some are Republicans, some are Democrats, to really come together to see how we can see the river system of the Mississippi, Missouri as one and defeat climate change, but also of course increase and improve the, the quality of life and, uh, and the f food production. Does that eventually change politics? Does commerce put pressure on politics so that people will understand that they can't rebuild on the barrier islands of South Carolina and North Carolina as easily as before? Because the good news is, of course, that all the key companies in modern American capitalism believe in uh, acting on climate change. They may not be perfect, uh, but we have just here, here in California visited Facebook, Apple, Google. All three of them want, want to move. They want to move into a more recycling economy. They are spearheading the uh, transformation into solar energy. They are doing a lot. But you can add up Microsoft, Walmart, uh, Starbucks, whatever company you, you want to mention. They, they are all moving on climate and they're not asking permission for Washington uh, to do it. So there is a lot of positive movement from private sector. But I want to add, we need to set out environment as a bipartisan issue. I, I, I don't, to me, it's impossible to understand how em environment has become a left-right issue in politics. Historically, protection of environment was a conservative cause. Uh, now it's seen as uh, you are on the left side if you speak about the environment or the liberal side. How come? This is a matter of the future of everyone. It's as much the future 
of an old farmer in Kentucky who voted for Donald Trump as for a, a, a young tech worker here in, here in California who voted for well, Jerry Brown or, 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 or Hillary Clinton. This is not left-wing, right-wing, Democrat, Republican. It's the future of humanity, and we need to come back to that. Remind yourself that Sh Schwarzenegger was the governor here. He, pre he was a uh, climate hero before, uh, before, um, uh, before Jerry Brown. And the Environment Protection Agency in this country was established by, uh, by, uh, by Nixon. So how we have come into this uh, incredible situation where environment is seen as a partisan rather than a bipartisan issue, we need to come back. It's clear you're a close observer of American politics <laughs> and uh, watching very closely uh, from your perch in Nairobi. But the paradox embedded in this, but and you, you're this right. This is so interesting. How can you, how can you not be interested <laughs> in the United States? Well, this has become a left-right <laughs> issue, but many of the American politicians who are the staunchest deniers that human activity is contributing to the warming of the planet are concentrated in those states of the United States where the changes have been the most extreme. Mm -hmm. In Phoenix, Arizona, by 2050, you're going to have 100 days over 100 degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, you have senators across the Sun Belt in Texas, members of Congress in Texas, where there, uh, a couple of years ago, were fires all across the state and weeks where the daytime high never got below 100 degrees. Those are the places where you are most likely to find the members of Congress who say that human beings are not contributing significantly to the change in the ecosystem. But what do you make of that? All through history, there have been people kind of uh, attacking progress or being, being on the sidelines of progress, and they are nearly ever seen as the heroes in the, in the books of history. Um, and there were people who were opposed to the Industrial Revolution at the very beginning. We are now laughing at them. I mean, people who said that the horses will remain forever. I can give you another example. The, the day I was born, my son bought the front, pa uh, front page of the biggest Norwegian newspaper of the day. It was the first flight across the Atlantic from Norway to the, uh, to the United States of America. <laughs> and then the shipping industry said, but this will have no impact on the shipping industry. Uh, I, I can still recall people who said, internet is a new fashion, it will, it will go away. Uh, so the people who are opposing this change into solar energy, into renewables, into a, a climate smart future, into electrical mobility, they will be seen uh, by history as the people who were opposed to the di digital revolution or opposed to the industrial revolution. They will be seen as failures. We've been getting very interesting questions from our audience here at the World Affairs Council in San Francisco. One recent change in China is that they've stopped buying the world's garbage. How should the international community respond to China's ban on materials that were going to be recycled? Uh, we should praise it. Uh, it, it is the right decision of China, of course, number one, of course, the Chinese are fully uh, uh, empowered to dis defend their own population against, uh, against dangerous poison of, of different sorts. But I think this will also be good for the world because when China has received so much garbage from other parts of the world that it had made Europe, Australia, and North America lazy. If they cannot uh, export it to China, well, they need to take care of it themselves. And through that, we will see an amazing t uh, improvement of technology because when the most advanced industrial nations need to take care of their own garbage, you will see the technology coming, you will see the private sector coming up with new, new ideas. So overall, this will be a huge uh, positive uh, for China, but the positive for all of us. What we need to avoid is, of course, that the garbage has gone to China, it's going to even po much poorer nations, which have no uh, ability to, to take care of them. But we also see now Vietnam saying, no, we will not take the garbage. And you see the Indians saying, we, no, we will not take it. So uh, I'm quite optimistic that the garbage will have to be treated by the countries of origin, which will be good for the techno technological and uh, uh, development and uh, innovation. One of our audience members wants to ask about Nigeria. Its economy has crashed, even with the oil industry. How do we help Nigeria convert to a green economy? What are you doing there to help? What options are there for other markets to update, to uplift their large populations? Um, there are 
big uh, schemes or programs, but they need to be implemented, not just to be drawn on the drawing board for the greening of the Sahel, which is of course the northern part of Nigeria, which is one of the poorest places in the world and the place in the world with the highest, highest population growth. Still, still women in the Sahel has guessed seven to eight children per, per woman, so it's an enormous rapid and, uh, population growth in a very vulnerable place uh, from point of nature, close to some of the terrorist uh, uh, ideological centers which can easily come across the Sahara. So it's a very vulnerable place, but it's also an enormous opportunity for solar energy. So the sun is shining basically all the time, enormous area, so there is no spa limit space limit for, for solar. And solar energy can also of be used to, to pump water, so you can combine uh, improving the energy with, with greening. It's at the end of the day a matter of mobilizing the political will and the economic resources to get, get this done. If you don't do it, uh, the population pressure on Europe, which you described, will, will for sure be very, very heavy. And Europe will tend to spend a lot of money to defend itself through well walls or borders or border police or whatever, rather than uh, assisting Sahel with, the, uh, with, with this uh, green wall or, uh, or solar energy revolution. And Northern Nigeria is part of that, that pr program. When you look at northern Nigeria, um, it is at the nexus of several countries that are the home of Boko Haram. Mm -hmm. Getting drier, getting hotter, getting harder to farm. Mm. Are these two things related? Absolutely, and that's even recognized by the United Nations Security Council, which has set out a resolution on the, on the Lake Chad. Uh, which say that lake the uh, climate change and the enormous environment destruction in the Lake Chad region is one of the amplifying factors of the Boko Haram, uh, which is one of the most hor horrible terrorist movements we have. Uh, Security Council does now exactly the same on Somalia, basically saying that if we want to stabilize Lake Chad or Somalia, well, we need a military response. I mean, you need to militarily defend yourself against terrorism. You need a political response, getting the politics right. And you need a climate and environment response because climate change is amplifying these conflicts. Lake Chad has been drastically reduced and of course making any number of fishermen and farmers there in jeopardy. And again, then more likely to support a horrendous group like, uh, like Boko Haram. So the future is linked this. And the interesting fact is that these resolutions have been passed by the Security Council, meaning that the Trump administration has voted in favor of them. And so has Russia, which historically also been very reluctant to embrace this environment security perspective. You've said that plastic pollution is a problem that matches global warming. Why is this? And what are some potential solutions there? Plastic is a horrible environment problem, and we, I mean, in many parts of the world, you see it everywhere. It's so many cities and beaches are uh, polluted with plastic. Problem with plastic is, of course, that it remains in oceans for, for thousands of years, and in cases for hundreds of thousands of years. This plastic now at the bottom of the Mariana Depression in, in, the, in the Pacific, which is uh, 11,000 meters down, in the Arctic, in the Pacific, places where there are no people. It's dangerous for animals. Uh, a whale died in Thailand a couple of months back. It had 80 plastic bags in, in its stomach. It was vomiting plastic bags wi while, uh, while dying. Uh, elephants have died in India from this, seabirds, turtles. So it's, it's for the animal kingdom, this is a really big issue. But it's also big for us because more and more small fragments of plastic come into our drinking water, into fish which we eat, uh, I don't think we are at the scientific conclusion yet as to how dangerous this is for humans, uh, but no one has proposed that it's good for us to have a lot of, lot of small plastic fragments in our, in our stomach and our blood. Bottled water and tap water from municipal systems around the world were tested last year and found to contain microplastics. There was, was not one source of the best drinking water in the world, which was completely free of small, small what we call mic microplastic. You ask what to do with it. There is a, here there is a fantastic progress. I mean, Prime Minister, India or, or Mo, uh, Prime Minister Modi of India has promised to phase out one-use plastic for India by 2022. It's such a brave uh, proposal. European Union has made a plastic strategy to phase it out. Very simply, to get rid of the plastic we don't need, no one needs straws. We can drink straight 
uh, from the bottle. I'm sure in uh, more or less your entire life, if you're drinking without straws, we have survived without that. We, we simply don't need it. We'll be demonstrating yeah. later. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that you can't drink without straws. No, we, we, but then, of course, there are uh, plastic we need. I mean, for instance, I mean, house isolation is uh, sometimes by, by, by plastic, or the cars are full of plastic, make them lighter and then using less gasoline. But then th that plastic needs to be brought in and recycled. And then we need new and better products. I see no reason why plastic, which we use for uh, keeping our food longer, for instance, cannot be, be made by degradable materials. Sugar canes or potatoes or cassava, just a matter of the industry being a little bit more innovative, so we'll see all these products coming. Uh, before too long, there are going to be 9 billion people on the planet. What rate of global population growth is sustainable? Are current rates sustainable, and based on what assumptions? That, that's quite interesting, but because we, have, we are now at a point of human history where the number of children are co is constant, meaning that we are, we are on the way to a stabilization of global population. I mean, up to now, of course, we have got m many more children than old people, but fr fr we are now at 2 billion children in the world, and that's expected to be constant through the 21st century. Still, we will see uh, 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 population growth because we are living longer, which is, of course, good news. Uh, but it's mainly focused in two parts of the world. Uh, it's in South Asia with India, and in I it's in Africa. The American continent, East Asia with China, Europe, population is stable, not, not, not increasing, and in some, some nations even, de even decreasing. But the to, the, to the extent there is a problem, the problem is that the population growth is fastest in the most vulnerable environment and political areas of the world, and of course it's we only see rapid population growth in the in the very poor parts of the world. There's no population. I mean, if we divide the, the world into uh, according to income, all population growth is with the very poor. As soon as you are up in the middle class, whatever nation you are living in, population growth uh, goes down to basically two 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 children per per women because then women are educated and they don't want that many children. They know that they do not need a lot of children for the future because uh, their children will grow up. Because if you are very poor, you, you produce a lot of children because you know a number of them will die. That we, we, I mean, up, up to modern times, half of all children uh, didn't live up to, to adult, uh, adulthood. So of course, if you were a rational mother, you needed to produce six children to get three into adulthood. We are gone, we, in the mi global middle class, that's not the case any longer, anywhere. Now, along with that stability of children, we're also going to have more old people mm -hmm. in more places in the world than we've ever had before. And that's very good news. We must, must not... F I don't <laughs> want to make it sound like it's bad news. <laughs> <laughs> I'm planning on being one of exactly. them. So, uh, exactly. exactly. But throughout world history until this moment, mm -hmm. you had to get rich before you got old. Mm -hmm. Countries that were on a track of expanding, steady wealth growth, mm -hmm. put in place public health measures, hospital systems uh, were involved in uh, uh, universalizing access to medicine. So you got old as you got rich. Mm -hmm. Now, in the for the first time in the history of the world, we're going to have a lot of countries that are not so rich, mm -hmm. that are home to very large numbers of old people, mm -hmm. where this same infrastructure is not in place, hospital systems, um, care systems for elderly people who are entering some of the most complex and expensive years of their lives. But l l let's be again a little bit more optimistic because the vast majority of humans are now middle class. Not middle class in the California sense, true. I mean, they don't have as much big uh, uh, villas or uh, as many cars as many people do have here. But middle class in the sense that they are not really uh, uh, not really wondering what they will eat tomorrow. Uh, they will be able to take the children into school. Uh, they may have a bicycle or even a motorbike, even if they cannot afford a, a car. Uh, they have a, have a dwelling which is stable and, uh, and uh, not brilliant, but okay. So, the and this middle class is becoming uh, older. Uh, the upper end, which is California and Norway, the lower end, which may be in places like Sri Lanka or in Vietnam or Kazakhstan or uh, Latin America, 
uh, but still it's a middle class and the good news is that this middle class is living to the 80s and even to the 90s I mean the ultimate example is South Korea if you are a girl born in South Korea today life expectancy is 90 not just what I mean in my mother's generation I mean one out of hundred women may reach 90 or one out of or five out of hundred but now on average a South Korean woman will live to 90 and we see this South Korea is of course the absolute top end but it's we see this positive news from everywhere in the world what are your thoughts on the ocean cleanup initiative recently launched recently launched to help clean the Pacific garbage patch brilliant <laughs> uh, it may or may not work uh, that that's too early to tell but it's brilliant that a young person from the Netherlands <laughs> got this idea when I think he was 16 years old started to bring together investors and others to get it done and let's see if, a, if it's a fantastic success brilliant even if it becomes a failure let's appreciate such a determination and, uh, and uh, an experimentation which is what we need because the main issue on plastic is to stop the flow of more plastic into the oceans but we also need to do an effort to bring in and destroy the plastic which is in the ocean. So uh, I will meet him tomorrow. I will, uh, I will give him a big hug <laughs> and, uh, and wish him all, the, uh, all well with this fantastic. Uh. Will we learn some things that can be applied to other places in the world if, if this even works some? Absolutely. Uh, I met some uh, shipping uh, people in Norway who wanted to do exactly the same I mean to see how they could use uh, ships which are now not not used for any other purpose to, to bring in plastic and, and recycle it and, and it, it, that will also bring us some information because if you bring in the plastic it will also be possible to see for instance how much of this plastic is actually coming from the United States of America or is it coming across the Pacific from China or, or Indonesia and other places and of course what companies are most represented with the with the plastic because it then much more easy to go to a government and say please take action or to a company whether it's Coca-Cola or, or whoever please take action uh, if you can document um, that the plastic is part of the problem lessening yeah. the impact of agriculture on the land by moving population and jobs to cities was mentioned earlier where will the food of the future come from if this trend continues food of the future will as no come <laughs> from <laughs> agriculture and from fisheries of course there are areas where we can uh, where we can increase i mean the oceans have an enormous potential for fish farming and increased uh, productivity if we can keep it clean and then this is an environment friendly way so there are uh, potential there Africa has a very very low productivity in agriculture if African, uh, African agriculture can be brought up to say a Asian standards uh, there is a huge potential increase um, in, in, uh, in, in food production in Africa but added to all this we, have we are throwing away 40 percent of the food we uh, are producing in some poor countries because they don't have the cooling system so they're eaten by rats or mice or, or insects uh, and in the, in the United States simply because we are buying more than we m more than we eat and uh, throw it away and we very often throw away fully eatable food and that's also as accept that there is a change of habits here uh, my grandmother never ever threw away any food item never ever my mother also was very, very hard to convince her that this food was so old that it needed to be thrown away. Uh, but for me, it's a kind of normal practice, sorry to say, uh, and my children the same. Uh, so if we could, uh, why not go back to the poor old days, at least be a little bit more responsible in the way we, we, we purchase, that will also, also help. One recent estimate put the waste at 30% of all the food in the United States. I mean, that's... It's a stunning it's amount of food. It's an enormous amount of food. Yeah. Are you as optimistic about biodiversity as you are about nations' ability to reduce carbon emissions? I think that's one of the biggest challenges we do have because we humans are so successful as a species. We are controlling everywhere uh, on the planet. Uh, and we are, of course... Uh, Still, while deforestation has redu reduced, it's still happening, uh, and we are 
uh, we are creating trouble for, for many other species. However, there is also an, an amount of success stories to be uh, proud of. And we have now a lot of new technologies which can also be used to bet take better care of, uh, of wildlife and, uh, and, um, and nature. So if you add the good polit the policies which are good in some nations, uh, in my nation Norway for instance, I was very proud as a Minister of Environment to sign the Nature Diversity Act, which is a piece of legislation which basically say that if you want to construct a road, well, you need to first look into what are the consequences for nature. If you want to construct a new housing area, again, you need to look into it. It's not to say that you cannot do it, but you need to document the potential consequences for nature. So we have good policies, and we have also in many areas uh, technologies which can be used to take much better care of, of nature. I mean, as an example, the Chinese have been very successful in uh, protecting the pandas, uh, and the panda population is uh, rapidly increasing, and it's a very high-tech operation because they have, uh, through uh, b best computer systems in the world, they have track of the pandas and they can know how uh, they know how to, for instance, avoid contact between pandas and humans. Because if a panda comes close to humans uh, and the f humans start feeding it, it's a very uh, uh, cute animal. Over time, the, uh, the animal will be dependent on humans and, 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 and not be a part of, part of our life. India, they have making corridors to make tigers, um, uh, pi tiger population increasing, and it's happening. Why is that? Well, this, the national parks they have are normally too small to have a uh, tiger population just in that park because then there will be interbreeding and over time a genetical de de degeneration. So they make corridors so that tigers can move from one national park to the other. That's difficult because tigers are <laughs> eating humans. It's one of the very, f very, very few uh, animals who are attacking humans to eat us. Uh, so it's not an easy animal to, mm, to combine with the livelihood of, of, of people. But they are successful. I mean, they, they are increasing the number of tigers, making bypasses over roads and, and uh, railroads, and making corridors between national parks. So again, it's within our hands to solve this problem. But it's an area where we need a substantial policy shift to be successful. Several of the models that you mentioned involved lessening the encounter between humans and some of these species. Mm. But some of what's going on on the planet right now involves the mechanics of the Earth. Mm. So uh, since time immemorial, flocks of birds have arrived in a specific place around the same time as the insects hatch. Mm. And they eat all the insects and keep on flying to their next place. Mm. Now they're reaching that place early mm. or late after the insects have already hatched and moved on mm. and dying in the hundreds of thousands. Mm. Um, birds that ate certain fish that arrived in certain places cued by the temperature of the water mm are now finding that they arrive in these places and the fish are not there. Mm. Uh, either the hatchlings die almost immediately or a, a sizable part of the flock dies from exhaustion trying to move on to its next spot. This mechanics of the planet, these things that happened without human intervention for thousands of years, uh, now will either require human intervention or uh, stopping messing things up so that the water is not changing drastically in temperature, uh, for an example. I mean, I, I'm wondering if it's too late for a lot of animals. No, I mean, you're absolutely right that there is an intimate uh, link between climate change and, uh, and, and the death of, of species. And, and, and one of the most important acts we can really do to protect nature is to, uh, is to reduce climate change or defeat climate change. Because you, you will have all these effects uh, which you're saying. Of course, it's also true that humanity has a better ability to uh, at least mitigate some of these uh, issues because we have better policies. I mean, you, we have better data system. Big, uh, big data can, of course, be used to spot where, where are the areas which we really need to protect. I mean, you don't need to protect everywhere, but you need to protect those areas which are particularly important for insects or for, uh, or, or for birds. So we have more tools to act, but it's a huge problem that climate change may have uh, this impact on, on, on different species, that's for sure. 
And I give you one example which, uh, which uh, clarify this. In, I was in Cape Town in South Africa, and they told me that the, in the hills of, the, of, of, the, of Cape Town, there are more species than in entire Europe. Uh, why is that? Because in Europe, because we had the Ice Age, that's the latest 10,000 years back, so the, uh, the nature has been uh, very volatile. Uh, only the, sp the species which can uh, adapt to very different circumstances could survive. While in, so in South Africa, the temperature has been stable, more or less constantly stable for the last two million years, which means that they have very specialized species. I mean, the foot of the hill, there is one species. At the middle of the hill is another species. At the top of the hill, there is a third species. That's very different from Norway, where we basically have the same species all over the place with some uh, modifications. Uh, and of course, it means that I even small temperature um, uh, variations in South Africa may have substantial uh, impact on, uh, on, uh, uh, on, on, uh, on nature. And maybe even clearer example is the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, which the northern part, I mean, 1,600 kilometers, so it's huge, it's like from here to, I don't know, but to the southern part of Mexico. So it's a huge area, it's completely bleached, and the main reason is just one degree change in water temperature, which you would think is nothing. I mean, if you can go for a, go for a swim here, you won't even recognize <laughs> one, one degree uh, change in the temperature. But for species like those um, populating the Great Barrier Reef, this is a life or death issue. China has expanded its industrial reach and its supply chains for raw materials very substantially into Africa. Earlier in our conversation, you were giving China a lot of credit for what it's doing at home uh, to lessen its impact on emissions. Uh, is it doing the same in places like Zambia, Zimbabwe, South Africa, where it's very heavily involved in extractive industries that contribute to in its industrial development? China is, of course, an enormous big nation with a strong state and, and, a, num and a number of private sector companies. And China is now the main trading partner with most African nations. So the influence of China and Africa is huge, for good and bad. Uh, there is a huge positive. I mean, they are constructing infrastructure in Africa, which no one else is doing. The Addis Ababa, Djibouti Railroad, or Mombasa, Nairobi Railroad, these are huge, huge po positive projects for Africa. It's also true that, of course, Chinese companies are involved in, uh, in different uh, uh, destructive practices. The only way to forward, which we try to devise with the Chinese government, is to see how we can get stopped the negatives and build upon the positives. That's, by the way, not very different from the United States of America or other nations we, uh, we, we can think of. Uh, there are positives and negatives in, in our relationships to, to others. But if, if, uh, if the United States uh, are not stepping up, of course, China is now such a major factor in Africa. I was last week in Beijing in the Africa-China summit. I think every president in Africa was there, all 50. There may have been one or two I didn't see, but I, 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 they were all absolutely everyone was there. So it shows the importance of, uh, of China to Africa as seen from Africa. The March for Climate, Jobs, and Justice was led by indigenous peoples from Brazil and peoples from the Central, and they walked uh, and arrived here where they met their counterparts from the San Francisco Bay. How do indigenous movements for sovereignty fit in the international dialogue on climate? They are, in my view, extremely important. Let me give you one example. So, um, Br Brazil has reduced the deforestation rate in the Amazon with 70%. Some of the biggest successes are in areas where indigenous people have been given the power to, to, uh, to defeat deforestation. Why is that so important? I mean, the, the indigenous people cannot do it unless they get the support of the state and the law of the police, because they're not powerful enough to fight the army of Brazil or, or the police. However, the police and the state do not have the outreach in all these areas wi which makes it possible for them to do it alone. So when an uh, indigenous group uh, in, in Brazil take care of a, a, a national reserve or an area, 
it has an enormous positive effect for that area uh, and you get the best of the state and the best of the indigenous uh, people. So I think uh, the role of indigenous people should not be underestimated. They are not that many in, in numbers uh, in most places, but they have a very important role to play as custodians of, 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 uh, of, the, of Mother Earth. I really want to uh, thank the audience. Um, not that I'm lazy. I, I usually come with enough questions and enough things to talk about you, but your questions have really been excellent. In so many instances, like the discussion about China and responsiveness of government, climate issues are framed by the other sides of the globe in wildly differing ways that lead to counterproductive misunderstandings. How can media in different countries, in different languages, overcome this? I think it would be very good if American media do not run around finding everything which is wrong in China. And I think it would be very good if Chinese media is not running around finding everything which is wrong in the United States of America. Uh, the more you can highlight uh, successes of others and building upon them, and the better we will be able to work together. I mean, what's absolutely certain is that if the United States and China, but of course India, Europe, Africa, if we all work together, we can basically solve all problems. If we allow ourselves to get into conflicts, I mean, not to speak about wars, uh, it's, uh, there is no limit to the tragedies we can we can produce uh, to do for the planet so the ability and the world together is maybe the most important word in in, in today's world uh, today's world eric solheim executive director of the united nations environment program thanks for joining us on thank world you. affairs thank you. please thank you <laughs>